Is your underage kid getting drunk at school? Is he telling you it's because he has a new friend who happens to be an alien and they have some weird emotional connection? Don't send him to the loony bin. Instead, send him down to Patty's Pub. Here we think it's safer to let kids drink watered-down beer in a safe environment. Maybe we have a social responsibility to provide a safe haven for these kids to be kids. We'd have to set up ground rules. Okay. No drinking and driving. Four drink maximum. Like, oh, yes. that's it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Listen, we water down the drinks. Jack up the oh, prices where I can make on. a serious profit off these kids. So send them down and we'll do our best at keeping an eye on them. That's Patty's Pub. As a reminder, just quickly please leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. Just quick press pause, leave the rating, then come back and finish listening to the rest of the episode. Thanks in advance. All right, on with the show. Lights, camera, action. Welcome back. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back. Oh, okay, let's do that over again. Okay. Are you going? Yeah. Okay. 1982? Mm-hmm. Correct. Welcome back to the Oscar Real Movie Podcast with Haley and Matt Schmidt. This week, we are breaking down the 1982 Best Picture winner, Gandhi. Also doing some real justice with that against E.T., the extraterrestrial. Um, also stick around. We've got new trailers this week. We actually have new trailers. It's exciting. We had a few to choose from. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Some that didn't make the cut, exactly. unlike last time when <laughs> day of a trailer came out. We were able to talk Quick about it. Quick threw it in. So yeah, we got uh, some trailers again this week and a top five to stick around for. So mm-hmm. stick around for that. Um, do we want to kick things off with what we've been watching, reading, whatever? Yeah. I still am not reading anything. <laughs> so very exciting stuff there, I know. <laughs> uh, other than that, we watched a handful of movies for this episode. Actually dragged you down to my level to watch like a handful <laughs> of uh, movies from 1982 to there, go along hey, with this. Hey, there are a lot of uh, a lot of good movies, so I was excited to watch a number of these. So it was fun. Yeah, 1982 was a sneaky good year in film. We'll talk about it later, but there were. There, don't I don't always do want to do a deep dive into like, years at the Oscars pre 1990, uh, but 1982 had a handful of very recognizable movies. So yeah, drag drag you down. <laughs> and uh, aside from that, I've been watching a show that you don't love, and I'll say it is okay, but I still don't love it. But it's something to keep my big dumb brain occupied for a while and that's the big bang theory yeah uh yeah it's okay i don't it's not amazing it isn't like uh i don't know if it's worth 10 seasons of a show that it got but uh you know it's 11 it's a I feel like oh, it was maybe 11 it was 11 or, it doesn't matter but uh but yeah for a network show i guess i get it but yeah that's pretty much all i've been doing mm-hmm. yeah i saw a few i mean in this this is probably not very fair because I feel like if you judge most series by their first season, it doesn't hold up very well. But yeah, I had seen some episodes in the first season. Like this is terrible. Like these, like I I couldn't make it through an episode. But with you having on in the background, it's like oh, there there's some funny parts. Yeah, you've said it gets better. So it's so it's okay. It's a lot of cheap jokes. You know, Chuck Lorre created it, and it's, I've heard some people say like he does like cheap joke type stuff you has know, he like, done something else that he would recognize he you always know, ask these tough questions <laughs> i know very very difficult too bad we have no way to ever find out we'll just have to debate it and see if we can figure it out right? can you imagine people who ask these questions pre the internet and what they'd have to do what would they do check out like the tv guide and look for like, a producer's <laughs> name or something well we'll kind of talk about that once we get into some of our 1982 movies because that uh, was fascinating to me watching a courtroom drama and they just like literally just 
rows and rows and stacks and stacks of books of legal cases. I'm like, wow, mm -hmm. being a lawyer would be so much harder back then than it probably oh, could sure. be. Oh, sure. No, hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. So here, Chuck Lorre. Uh, here's some of his credits. Uh, Roseanne, Dharma, and Greg. Mm -hmm. And now here's where we get into what I would call some of the cheap uh, <laughs> joke shows, and that's two, two and a Half Men. Oh, yeah. And then The Big Bang Theory. Uh, Mike and Molly. Mm-hmm. Mom. So, a bu that, like, that's, all, that's all, C all right now, CBS stuff. Sure. Okay. But, yeah, it's so like network um, sitcoms but and he, stuff he, is what... He did do the Kaminsky Method, which is Netflix, that one with Alan Oh, Michael Douglas. yes. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, a handful of those, you know, laugh track kind of sure. give me that uh, mom-dad joke, like the dad <laughs> joke stuff. Uh, but that's kind of what Big Bang Theory is, you know, they're... I mean, everyone knows what the show is about, but it's a bunch of cheap, like, oh, Sheldon makes a, he's smarter than this person is joke. I guess I'll laugh at that, but <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's on HBO Max. I don't think any other HBO thing, like ah, Go okay. or anything, it's on Max specifically. Cool. Um, only new update for me, I've gotten back into Million Dollar Listing New York. I watched, I don't know, like the first five or six seasons of that, and then... I just felt like I was watching way too much stuff and took that, uh, I stopped putting that on the DVR, so, um, but there was a new episode the other night that I happened to just catch, I was like, oh, I should go back, kind of like you said, we have time and it's nice putting something on in the background sometimes, so I've been catching up on Million Dollar List in New York, which is so fascinating, I've told you it's, it's crazy, because not only are these apartments in New York City millions of dollars, but they're always all cash offers. Like, these people don't have mortgages. Like, it's not a loan. They're just like, oh, this apartment's for sale for $5 million. Okay, yeah, I have $5 million in the bank, so I'll just buy it and I'll close in 30 days. It's like, oh my God, that is so not a life that Real I have any does. exposure to. I know. So it's just, it's super fascinating to see how um, certain people in the world live. Like, better than us? <laughs> I'm not saying it's better. It's just different. <laughs> Where money isn't an issue. <laughs> Where money is literally not an object. I know. So that's been uh, fun. And then last week, this was cool. You and me and uh, my cousin Drew, we did a movie trivia, like, online thing. Mm -hmm. It was all movie scenes. So they had, like, um, clips and stuff for movies. And uh, that was fun. We were perfect in the first half. Yeah, yeah. And then couple falters in the second half. Not a lot wrong, but there I think there are a couple teams that yeah. didn't get any, anything wrong. Yeah. But yeah, we uh, we made a good team, the three of us. So that was a lot of fun to do that. We've done a few of those before with some other family members and stuff too. But we did that last week, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Um, let's get into the trailer park then. Do you want to introduce the first one? I don't know. This one is so near and dear to your heart. <laughs> so it's the new Bill and Ted movie. What was it called? Face the Music? Yeah. Bill and Ted Face Music. I have zero exposure to Bill and Ted, so I don't know. This trailer made no sense to me. So g give, me, give me a rundown. Why should I care? <laughs> Why should you care? Well, it's Keanu Reeves, right? Like, yes. you care about anything. Uh, that is it. the one thing I said. He actually is starting to look old now. Yeah, he doesn't have the beard from John Wick or mm. facial hair. Yeah. So he's looking a little older. It looks a little more so, weathered. Yep. Uh, so the, this is the third movie of the Bill and Ted franchise. So the first one was Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. came out in 89. Uh, this one I watched a decent amount as a kid. So they have to write a history paper and they get a time machine and just go back in time and find all the people they need to write a history paper on ah, and that's okay. what they do yeah and then the second one uh is more so i think what this third one is a continuation of so they have to write the perfect song to unite the world otherwise the future is terrible so okay. at the end of the second one they actually do it they like are at a battle of the bands or something like that and they put on like the greatest show of all time and it goes worldwide and everything so apparently in this third movie they did that but apparently it didn't work because in the trailer <laughs> they say like they're back in the future or something and the and the the powers to be of the future tell them 
you put on that great show, but it didn't work, and now, right now, you're playing music at, like, a bingo club for old people. Like, you, you need to get your shit together here. Mm-hmm. So they decide to go to the future when they've already wrote the song and then steal it because it's not a crime if you're stealing it from yourselves. It's like Nixon. Like, if the president does something, it's not illegal. It's like <laughs> that whole mindset. Yeah. And then they, so they, they, I guess that's the idea of the movie. I mean, it's a teaser, so it's a minute and a half long. We don't get a ton of it. We do get themselves as giant bodybuilder and people in prison. Uh, so we get that, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, I guess from someone who's not a Bill and Ted stand or fan, this probably made no sense to you. What is, what is no, this? No, it made zero sense and it had zero appeal. <laughs> I will say it looks kind of, I'm unsure on this one. Uh, there have been rumors that they're going to be making a third Bill and Ted for a long time, and I never felt like they really needed to. I think the second one is actually really good. Like, I think critically the first one is considered quote-unquote better, but I think the second one is actually really good. And it closed it off. Like, at the end of the movie, they put on the big show, so you just assume that everything works out. Mm-hmm. And now they're just kind of saying, nope, that didn't work out, so... I don't, it seems like something a sequel that's unnecessary, which I feel like has been going on a little bit lately, like with uh, what John Tatero did, a, a somewhat sequel to The the Big Lebowski, and yes, I thought that right. that trailer looked terrible, and it turns out that movie was terrible. I didn't see it, but just everyone else seems to say that about it. Uh, and this doesn't look bad like that, like on that level, but it does look somewhat unnecessary. And, you know, it'll be fine, but I just, I don't know. I'm a little unsure on this one. So, yeah, the next next trailer, Palm Springs, starring uh, at Andy Samberg and the mom from How I Met Your Mother. Yeah, uh, Kristen Milioti. Sure. That's her name. Yep. She'll just always be the mother. mother from, yep, I would say that's what people recognize her from, but Even yes. though it takes all nine seasons for her to get introduced for her to be in like show, three that, episodes that's what she's yeah. like known for yep uh so this is like a groundhog day um andy samberg is a character who is stuck in a infinite time loop and meets the mom from how i met your mother and they go on a date and then she gets accidentally dragged into this time loop so both mm-hmm. of them are living the same day over and over and over again Uh, This premiered, I think, at Sundance earlier this year to amazingly high acclaim. I think it's the, uh, let me look it up, but I think it's the largest uh, like purchasing deal, like distribution deal to ever come out of Sundance. Oh, really? So that gives me a lot of hope for it. Like, I have to think that this is good. That's fascinating because it's like, how do you take something like Groundhog Day, which already has like you know, uh, somewhat romantic, like, storyline to drive it and have, like, another kind of yeah. Groundhog Day with some romantic... I mean, it seems like this is a little bit darker in certain ways, but, um, yeah, I'm interested to see how you make it different enough where it's, like, how is this different than Groundhog yeah, Day? Yeah, that's kind of, like, almost exactly what I had written down. Like, I said, what's... I said, there's also some... Oh, what were you going to say? Like, what's the, the, the Tom Cruise, um, Emily Blunt one? Oh, um, Live, Die, Repeat. Uh, Edge of Tomorrow? Edge of Tomorrow, yeah. Like, that's an action thing. And it's just, like, they live the same, like, action scene over and over. So it's, like, that has a different feel in Groundhog Day. Like, the concept's the same. They keep reliving it over and over. But because it's a completely different setting, like, it feels different enough to me. This mm-hmm. one, I'll be interested to see how different it is. Yeah, this one... I also said I'm kind of unsure about it, but I'm going to lean more towards it'll probably I'm ho- it'll probably be good because of the reaction at Sundance. And that isn't like a universal, this is a good movie thing, because right. Sundance is for independent films, and, you know, the standard, right, wrong, or indifferent, the standard for, like, how good an independent film is is different than studio films, because they're just, they, they're just different. The money isn't always there. The stories can be kind of different out there just because they're independent, so they have that different feel to them. So we'll see, but this is still, it's still Andy Samberg, it's still a big name. Uh, But you're right, I I had almost the exact same thing written down, where how is this going to be different than Groundhog Day? Because it's still a romantic comedy, just like Groundhog Day. 
which I, we reviewed Groundhog Day, and I love that movie. Mm-hmm. It's almost a perfect movie to me. Uh, and one of the things I like about that movie is you don't really know why and how he's living the same day over and over again. It's just happening, and I right. like that in that sense. Sure. And in this, in the trailer, like they show... I mean, they don't explain it exactly, but there's a cave with a bright light, you know, that they walk into. So you see the supernatural effect on it. Yeah. So uh, explaining that might take some of the mystique off of it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like one of my critiques on Groundhog Day was I didn't love the, you know, romantic storyline in it. Like, and Andy McDowell and Bill Murray falling in love was it it was it was good but it it wasn't the best part of the movie for me yeah so maybe this will handle the love story differently because they're both going through it who knows but i'm gonna lean towards it'll be good because of the initial reaction to it and in the trailer i mean this it's always weird when they put a rotten tomato score in the trailer because those change so often (laughs) in the trailer they said 100 percent on rotten tomatoes but i mean that could be down to 90 or 80 percent by tomorrow so i always think that that's a weird choice to do mm-hmm. i always like it when they update it I, rem- I don't remember all the movies to be exact but they'll be like oh 98 percent around tomatoes and then tomorrow they'll re-air that same tv spot for a movie and it'll be like oh 92 percent like they have to constantly update it <laughs> um but yeah here you go holds uh palm springs holds the record for biggest sale of a film at sundance film festival beating the previous record by 69 cents so oh I, think, my God. I think someone just wanted to make a point. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if six the sixty nine is the point, or if they just said that. <laughs> nice. That's a good number. Where you just want this to be the biggest okay. distribution. I don't know. Well, that's interesting. Um, but yeah, this is gonna be a Hulu movie. Like, not going to theaters or anything. It's being okay. released digitally July tenth. It's so, gonna be like uh, like on demand. Like, I would purchase it, or is it? I don't. I assume not because it's a Hulu original. It's I a Hulu assume, original. Okay, I, I gotcha. would assume it's just kind of like a uh, uh, big time adolescence or sure. something like that. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll have a new one. When is that coming out? July tenth. July tenth. Okay. I just said it. I, I know. I'm like you probably just said it. <laughs> My bad. It's okay. When's it coming out? July. July tenth. Good one. That okay. was really funny. It wasn't. <laughs> That's okay. I'm bringing the dad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last trailer is a prequel to uh, The Kingsman 1 and 2, and that's The King's Man, uh, written and directed by Matthew Vaughn, so the same guy who did the first two, uh, which I, we never, I don't think you, did you ever see the second one? No. I, I never didn't. saw it. The first one's great. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one, I think, got. Not as good of reviews, but it's still okay. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, starring Ray Fiennes. Uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson is apparently in this. I didn't remember oh, seeing him in the Oh, I didn't see trailers. him in the trailer at all. But uh, yeah, so this is a prequel set around World War One time, and it's basically how Rafe and his protege start the Kingsman uh, organization. So, yeah, this is the third, I think, third trailer, like a teaser, and then this is the second actual trailer for it. So, you know, we get a little more uh, information in it, not a ton more. You see the silhouette of whoever the main bad guy is in it and some more action scenes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this. Like, I really like the Kings, the first one, the Kingsman. Um, I like Matthew Vaughn's style in how he directs and just his his humor that he has in some movies it's sometimes kind of a darker uh humor uh, you know, he did x-men for his class which is one of the best x-men movies of that whole franchise mm-hmm. some cool action scenes where the camera's like on the sword and they're fighting it so it might yeah. get a little maybe you get a little dizzy watching this i don't <laughs> know uh but yeah, what were your thoughts on it if you had any yeah, no, I think it looks interesting. Uh, like I said, the first one was really good, and we've seen it a few times. Uh, if it's on TV, I'll usually turn it on. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to see kind of how it started, and it's I feel like it's kind of a twist on a James Bond type thing, and it's like those are always exciting. So they always have these gadgets, and I don't know. I like yeah. origin type stories, so it'll be cool to see kind of how it starts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I always felt like these were kind of, not a parody of Bond, but like, Bond is ridiculous, but it tries to take itself seriously, and this yes. is like, yeah, a little more on the 
this is ridiculous and we know it's ridiculous side of things. So, Agreed. Uh, yeah, very, very exciting. Pretty much the only note I had for this trailer is this looks great. I want to see it. Um, Yay. <laughs> I know. I didn't, I, wasn't, I didn't get too creative with this. So this one, I think, is going to be in theaters. And right now the release date is September 18th. We'll see if that sticks. Uh, but yeah, that's the plan for it right now. Cool. Mm-hmm. Put on the list. That Maybe in theaters. Yeah. We'll see. Which, <laughs> like, so theaters around... They're going to be opening up in like July-ish? Yes. There are some theaters that are opening in July. And we... Marcus Theaters are the the one the kind of the big one in Wisconsin, and I was looking on their website, and a couple in Wisconsin are already reopened, but for oh, the okay. ones in Madison, it says like date to be determined still. Mm-hmm. But I know like AMC, they're opening theirs up around July fifteenth, I want to say, and then Tenet moved their release date back they to did. Okay. to the thirty first, I want to say, yeah, July thirty mm-hmm. first. So still coming up soon, uh, but. What are you, how comfortable would you be in going to see it? Like, what would be the earliest you would comfortably go see a movie in a theater? Uh, I don't know. August, maybe? Yeah, just see how it goes course, for a little it's while. it's, like, already the end of June. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, it's tough. Because uh, theaters, I think some theaters are saying they're not requiring people to wear masks in theaters. Probably so they can... Sell concessions yeah. and stuff. Yep, that's their big money maker. Yeah. So so mm-hmm. it's just interesting to see how many people would wear masks into yeah. a movie. Uh, because Tenet, Tenet's the big... Actually, Mulan, I think, comes out July 24th. So that's like the first big movie to hit theaters. I need and to then, see Mulan. And then Tenet... But I don't need to see it in a the theater. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I just figured I wanted to see like what your comfort level would be. Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably have to wait at least a month just to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. But it's tough. I do want to see Tenet. Uh, but that's, that's a tough one. Tough situation <laughs> we're in yep. right now. Uh, I guess this could have been part of the trailer park, but a teaser for the Snyder Cut came out. It was really like 30 seconds long. I know I showed it to you. Um, maybe you had a... Maybe you enjoyed it, maybe not. It was only 30 seconds, but I know I liked it a lot because it already fixed a big problem that I had with the original Justice League, and that's when we watched it, the original Justice League, there's a flashback scene where all these people are fighting Steppenwolf in this, like, ultimate fight for survival, and I always looked at that weird, like, shouldn't that be Darkseid? Like, he's the ultimate bad guy. Like, shouldn't that fight be against Darkseid? I thought it was weird with Steppenwolf. Well, in... A 30-second teaser, Zack Snyder already fixed it by having Wonder Woman look at, like, an old hieroglyphic of a drawing of Darkseid, mm-hmm. and then, boom, like, cuts to that flashback scene, and Darkseid is literally in the place of where Steppenwolf was in the theatrical version of Justice League. Yep. So, I'm just, as excited as I was for this before, I'm even more excited for it, because I think Zack Snyder, I mean... Good or bad, whatever you think of his movies in the past, I want to see his vision on this movie because it always felt weird to me that Justice League didn't bring up or close out any plot lines that Batman v Superman brought up, so I'm excited for it. Cool. Next year, right? HBO Max? Yeah, 2021. 2021. Yes, ma'am. I also heard today, since we're kind of talking in superhero universe, uh, Michael Keaton said he will come back to play Batman in the Flash movie. Oh, yeah, I did see that. I didn't look in. Around. I didn't look into the details too much, but uh, caught the headline and um, yeah, talking about these just remind me of that. So I don't yeah. have much details, but yeah, I, I saw that floating around too, and I didn't know what that meant. Like, are they saying that Batman eighty nine is like? in the DC EU un- universe now or is it a flashpoint thing where it's like a different parallel universe or something did you hear the news about gone with the wind i did all right did you want to explain what's going on there um yes i it was one of those things where i'm like ugh people need to get over it so i didn't spend a whole lot of time uh <laughs> digging into the details but um, it's been taken down from some streaming f- platforms because of its, um, like, racist messaging and undertones and what have you. Um, and really the biggest thing that I, 
I feel like came from this is then everyone's like, oh, then you should take down Blazing Saddles because that's so much worse. But people that's are very... That's on purpose, though. People are, yes, very quick to point out, no, Blazing Saddles is a satire. Um, like, M- Mel Brooks, is that right? Yes. Mel Brooks and Richard Pryor wrote this together to shine a light on racism Mm -hmm. instead of Gone with the Wind, which is just like, oh yeah, we're racist and it's fine, whatever. So, you know, it's different situations. Of the times. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, So, yeah, that was quite the big hoopla for like a 24 hour period, I feel like, and then people stopped caring, which is probably fine. Um. (laughs) Yeah, well, and they're, they're putting it back up too. Because the point was they t- they took it down and they're adding a message to the beginning of it saying, like, this movie contains racial tones that we do not condone. So they're putting okay. it back up. Okay. I gotcha. But, I didn't know that part. Okay, yeah, that's that's the whole point. They even announced it when they took it down. They're like, we're just taking this down for a little bit. We're just going to put it back up with messaging that we don't condone some of the racial overtones that are in this mm-hmm, movie. Mm-hmm. And, like, the the stands on the other side will be like, oh, but it's not racist because it gave an Academy Award to the first African-American, like, actor in um, Hattie. She won Best Supporting Actress for this movie. But it's like, yeah, that's great, but it doesn't <laughs> condone the fact that slavery is is viewed as, like, something that's okay. Yeah. At the time. Like, that's just not okay. Exactly. Like, get over yourselves. Yep. Can't wait to review that movie. It's the best picture winner. I know. I've never seen it. What year was it? 30? 30. I've got it right here. I want to say 39. 39. 1939. Won 10 Oscars. Oh, my God. The original epic. You know what's fascinating is, like, you look at, um, uh... I mean, we kind of have this in our next note, so maybe this is a good segue. Um, Academy Awards are going back to uh, giving out 10 Best Picture nominees again. Um, right now, they're doing anywhere from 5 to 10. Mm-hmm. The next ceremony, I don't know if it's like starting with the 2021 or starting with the 2022. It's, I don't think it's the next one. Like this upcoming one that they moved to April 25th. From February. I don't think that one will have the 10. I think it'll I don't still think have the so. hold up to. Yeah. Um, but what's fascinating, because I had seen a graph of like, oh, here's how my Best Picture nominees there were every year. And so the vast, vast majority of the Oscars, they've always had five. Mm-hmm. And then they had a few years where it's like, we're doing 10. And then it's like, no, sometimes we're throwing in movies that don't necessarily deserve a Best Picture. So we're doing anywhere five to 10. And now they're saying, we're doing 10 again. What's crazy to me is looking back in like the 30s and 40s, they also had, like, because I always think, like, they weren't even making that many movies back then. But most of them in the 30s were, had, like, 10 films nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. I'm like, did you just nominate everything that came out that year? I say, <laughs> like, I'm sure they weren't making as many movies. No, they were they just weren't. nominating 10 movies. It's like, oh, this one lasted more than an hour. You get credit. <laughs> yeah. Feels like a participation trophy. Yeah, and that's, I don't know. I don't really care that they're do it and making it 10 because they kind of had the option to do that anyways like you could do up to 10 exactly. so making it a mandatory thing i don't really think does anything no it like, doesn't they, they say they're doing it because of just to like promote like diversity in film and recognize um like different films that they normally wouldn't nominate in a normal year but it's like you already have the option of going up to 10 yeah i'm so gonna let's just nominate the movies that qualify don't put something in there because you feel obligated to. Yeah, I'm just gonna go, it's just a bunch of bullshit. Like, it's themselves trying to make themselves feel better. Like, I love the Oscars and the Academy and the whole, like, you know, watching all the movies that get recognition. Like, that's great, but they did this original expansion in, like, 09 or, or 2010 because the initial outcry was, oh, um, The Dark Knight didn't get nominated for Best Picture, so we need to expand it. And they expanded it, but they haven't done anything with it. They It's been the same type of movies, dramas. Mm-hmm. You know, you can usually, you can tell when a movie's Oscar baity or not. And sometimes they have put in movies that just flat out aren't, they don't deserve it. Like, I love Steven Spielberg, but War Horse didn't deserve the Best <laughs> Picture nomination. And mm-hmm. uh, what's the one with Tom Hanks, the 9-11 Tom Hanks movie um, that got 
a Best Picture nomination. It was based off a book, like uh, Extremely Loud and what is Incredibly it? Incredibly Close? Y- yeah. I think that's it. That's about 9-11? I don't yeah, think I knew that. Tom Hanks is a dad in that and he dies in 9-11. Mm. Um... Yeah, like that movie did not deserve a Best Picture nominee, and just making this mandatory, it doesn't, it really doesn't. Cha- you, if you want to change how, mo- like, which movies are getting nominated, you need to change more than just how many movies are yeah. allowed to get nominated. Because Straight Outta Compton came out in 2015 when they had the option to do up to 10, and it still didn't get nominated. Right. It 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 depends more on the Academy voters than it does. Like, how many opportunities you have to nominate. Yeah. Like, unless unless they specifically said, oh, we can have, like, five dramas and two comedies and two whatever fantasy foreign movies. Foreign film. Uh, foreign, and yeah. yeah, like, unless they specifically lay it out like that, which I don't know if I, I like. I don't know how you, you feel about that. I feel like that's being too, like, systematic with it. Right, right. But I, I don't know. I don't think this is going to do anything. In the short term, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that kind of leads into the other topic I had, which is the Academy. We kind of brought it up already, but they changed some dates around. So the award eligibility got changed. So movies that come out in January, February 2021 now qualify for the 2020 Academy Awards. Uh, the nominations are now going to be announced on March 15th. And then, like we said earlier, the Oscars will actually be on April 25th. So, basically, instead of trying to jam all the movies that have been delayed into, like, just December, they're letting them release them into January and February mm-hmm. the following year now. Which, yeah, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Which is funny, because normally that's the dumping grounds for <laughs> shitty movies. <laughs> yep. Like, Doolittle came out in January, February of last year. I was, I think Bad Boys for Life came out, and that's apparently good, so I shouldn't say all <laughs> all movies are the, that's the dumping grounds for them. But it's kind of funny that uh, January, February, we might actually have a bunch of good movies to go see mm-hmm. instead of, like, debating whether a movie's worth it or not. Yep. Uh, and then the last couple things of news I had were unfortunately on the sadder side of things, and that's t- today actually Joel Schumacher passed away. And while uh, I didn't love what he did with the Batman uh, series, he did do a bunch of great movies. Uh, kind of the, the 90s uh, was his time to shine. He did Falling Down with Michael Douglas, which is a pretty good movie, The Client. So a uh, yes. John, Grisham John Grisham banger with Susan Sarandon getting a... She got an Oscar nomination for that role, actually. Uh, and then A Time to Kill, which I think that might be a John Grisham it one is. as well, right? Yep. Matthew McConaughey. Pretty sure. Hmm. Now you're making me question it, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. You're the, you're the expert. <laughs> I know. I do like his books. <laughs> um, And then, yeah, he did the Batman Forever, Batman and Robin. It, I mean, that's always sad news. He's a name everyone, I think, knows for good or bad, I, yeah, right? Yeah, I was going to say, I saw the news on, uh, on Twitter. I'm like, I don't exactly know who this is, but I know the name. And so I'm like, Matt, Joel Schumacher passed away. And you're like, whoa, shit. Like, he's directing mm-hmm. a lot of stuff. I'm like, ah, director. Yep. Yep. There we go. Uh, he also did the Lost Boys, which I know a couple. I have a couple friends who they'd be upset if I didn't bring up that movie. It's a vampire movie. That's pretty good oh. from the late eighties. So nice. And along the same lines, a uh, couple days er- uh, earlier, like a day or two ago, Ian Holm also passed away. Uh, I I would say he's a little more well known. If you don't know the name, which maybe not everyone does, you're gonna recognize his face. Uh, I mean, most people our age uh, would recognize him from Lord of the Rings trilogy, the original uh, trilogy. He played Bilbo Baggins in that. Uh, But he also, he got an Oscar nomination for our very first episode movie that we reviewed, uh, Chariots of Fire. Uh, That was his Oscar nominated role. But he also was in one of my personal favorite movies, Alien. He was the uh, Ash, the android. And then another kind of cult classic from the 90s, which I'm not sure if you've seen or not, but The Fifth Element. I have not seen the whole thing. It's a, it's a pretty good movie. I think people talk it up a little bit more because it is a cult classic. People are like, oh, this is amazing. Got to see it. It's really good. Bruce Willis is in it. Uh, Mila Djokovic is in it. Um, and Djokovic. And, and, Djokovic. Novak Djokovic? <laughs> yeah, Novak. No, not <laughs> Novak Djokovic. You see, he got people. Uh, he, he hosted like a tennis tournament 
and no. someone got sick from COVID. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> yep. Uh, Freaking Novak. Novak. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Ian Holm, classic actor. It's also very sad to see him go as well. With that, on to our breakdown of 1982 Best Picture winner, Gandhi. Gandhi. You, yeah, did you want to lead us into this? Sure. Um, so, like you mentioned, Gandhi came out in 1982. It's... Um, biopic about Gandhi. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Uh, ben Kingsley stars as Gandhi in the movie. Um, a few other faces. Martin Sheen is in this um, towards the end. We also have, um, shoot, I don't have his name in front of me, but it's the guy who plays uh, Uncle Dursley in the Harry Potter movies. Oh, yeah. Um, he's in this, as is uh, Candace Bergen. She's in a few scenes as well. So, um, But, I mean, Ben Kingsley is the star of this film. Uh, it was directed by Richard Attenborough. He is like the old scientist, doctor, whatever, in Jurassic Park. And, I uh, asked you if this is a guy that did the narrations for like Planet Earth. He said no. It's his brother. Yeah, I correct. Think, I think David <laughs> David Attenborough Attenborough. does the narration. Yes, but yeah, he's a uh, oh, what's his name? X Big X in The Great Escape. Oh, too. yes, that's right. Yes, yes. So uh, like I said stars Ben Kingsley, directed by Richard Attenborough. Um, it was nominated for a whopping eleven Oscars. It won eight. Um, it won Best Picture. Best Actor went to Ben Kingsley. Richard Attenborough won Best Director. It also won for Original Screenplay, Cinematography, Set Decoration, Film Editing, and Costume Design. Um, a special note about Costume Design. Uh, one of the two designers, um, Banu Ataya, was the first Indian-born person to win an Oscar. So that was kind of cool. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, the three other nominations it had was sound, makeup, and then original score. Um, and Ravi Shankar uh, helped on the original score. So I feel like some people probably know his name. So want to throw that in there as well. So eight wins for this epic biopic, The Life of Gandhi. It even has an intermission in, in the middle. We were talking about yeah. Gone with the Wind earlier. Like the newest movie with an intermission is that's a good question not that this is a new movie because it's from 1982 and it's almost 40 years old but <laughs> just so crazy i usually think of an intermission from the 60s yeah yeah it starts with him in the late 1800s like 1890 ish where he's uh, a lawyer he's on his way to south africa and uh, the very beginning of the movie kind of sets up the rest of it where he's met with complete terrible racism. They say uh, they've never had a, a, there is no such thing as a, a black lawyer in South Africa and he's not allowed to sit in first class. Basically, the first part of the movie is him in South Africa fighting for Indian rights in within the country. Uh, workers' rights, things like that. And he puts on a nonviolent protest there and... I think gets imprisoned and eventually does win rights for them in South Africa. And so after that, he goes back to India, I think around 1915, and is met with high praise and a lot of favor and is kind of asked, what are you going to do next? And he says, I don't really know. And he takes a tour around the his homeland of India and kind of realizes what he wants to do, and that's fight for the freedom of India from the British rule. So the rest of the movie is, you know, basically that, right? It's him fighting for the freedom of India from Britain. It hits all the important things. I mean, we can talk about it later, but it, it hits a lot of the big events that happens in his life, which includes the, which I thought was kind of cool, it's a single day where he... They get the word out to the entire country, like him as his advisors, that this specific day everyone should treat as a day of prayer and fasting. So literally the entire country shuts down and the British can't do anything. It was kind of their moment of like, there's 350 million of us in this country. We outnumber you by how much. And we're, if we can, sh if we want to shut this country down, we can. 
which I thought was that was very powerful. That was it's just crazy to think that you could actually do that. Do you think anyone in this day and age could organize uh, that many people into shutting down a country or doing one thing? Hmm? Maybe Gen Z. Gen, Gen Z and K-pop stands have been. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Gen Z and K-pop stands for Big their work in Tulsa. The weekend, yeah. Um, but I mean, realistically, no. It's no. crazy. It's crazy to think that you could do that. Very too. impressive. And pre-technology to the point of like, maybe like, like mass communication. Type yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Or like they had to like get the word out via newspapers or and word of mouth word of, yeah i mean i'm sure they had some form of like you know the telephone or a or radio a radio stuff possibly. like that but to get it to the entire country is insane and, to me and, and, and have really that cool. many people willing to participate because i think a lot of yeah. times people come across stuff and it's like yeah i mean that sounds good in in theory but in practice i probably won't yeah. do it like, uh, so crazy that he did that I, I really i found that part fascinating so yeah it, it shows that Along with, um, I also thought this was cool. He he tries to also gets the the word out there that people should make their own clothes in India so that you wouldn't have to they wouldn't have to buy from the English factories or, yep. or and things like that, which I thought was really cool. And that's uh, I think that's why their flag has the the spinning spin, wheel, the spinning wheel it on it as like a cool little uh, homage to Gandhi and what he did and like make your own clothes and then we don't have to buy it from them and kind of shut them down to an extent. Right, right. And it's about like here here are our first steps to independence. Like mm -hmm. we can We can do it ourselves. We don't have to rely on them. Yeah. We know how to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And then along those same lines he goes on the salt march, uh, where, you know, normally they'd have to buy salt from, you know, again, English or British factories, but he said, No, we're gonna march to the sea and make our own salt, which was illegal at the time. Uh, there was a salt tax going on too. So there's a big part of it where a lot of, so he was nonviolent, right? But there were naturally some violent protests that would happen. Kind of, I mean, not this movie hits more to home in the present day than, than you probably does. would have thought it does. Yep. But uh, there were some violent rioting and protests that happened while Gandhi had this going on. And as soon as that happened, he wanted to shut it down. And they're like, there's no way we can make everyone stop rioting and protesting. And he went along the lines of, well, if people really care about me, then I'm just going to not eat until all of it stops. And that was kind of his way of trying to unify everyone, mm -hmm. hoping that everyone would unite around him, uh, which worked. I think he does it twice in this movie. And the first time is to stop, yeah, the rioting and violence uh which is successful and then uh eventually he, they win the freedom for india and then the last portion of the movie is kind of how they the aftermath in the sense of like they divide india up a little bit because one of his advisors uh is muslim and pa and pakistan and he's from pakistan and he says that he wants the portions of India that are majority of Muslim to be actually be Pakistan, which causes some friction towards the end of the movie, a lot like internally with Gandhi and his advisors, but also with the people mm -hmm. of the country. Because on the other hand, you have those that are um, Hindu. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it kind of creates uh, some tension in the end where the Hindu and Muslims start kind of fighting each other a little bit. And then Gandhi wants to stop it so he does uh, his fasting protest again to get them to stop which again is successful but then uh, the movie ends with it actually begins with him getting shot but then the rest of the movie is a flashback and it ends up at that same point where he gets shot by uh, a hindu uh, like protester who is upset that gandhi was willing to work with the muslims and we kind of know that because he's in one other scene earlier in the movie where when Gandhi's going to talk to his advisor who's from Pakistan, he's the eventual shooter is part of that group who was like, no, you shouldn't be going to talk to him. Don't talk to them. So you kind of make the assumption that that's what he's upset about. So yeah, it's three over three hours long. I think te like three hours and 10 minutes long. I mean, it packs in 50 ish years of this man's life into a movie and I think I think it's it's tough. Biopics are tough where you're constantly not constantly, but at least this is me. 
whenever I'm watching one, in the back of my head, I'm always going, is this true? Did this actually happen? Oh, my so gosh. It can be really That's easy. That's what I always, I <laughs> always do. I'm like, did that person really say that? Did that really happen like that? Yeah, so they can be tough to make. They're generally perceived really well by the Academy. I yes. mean, whether you're acting like a lead role in one of these movies or just for best picture, I mean, they're usually favored by the Academy, which some people love that, some people don't. For acting, some people like it, some people don't because you actually have a real life person to compare them to. So is that more impressive or less impressive when you do it well? You know, that's up for debate. Uh, but yeah, this is, in my opinion, a really good biopic. I enjoy this movie a lot, even though it's three plus hours long. I mean, this man did so much in his life that it's tough to get everything in. But I think Richard Attenborough did a great job of getting the quote unquote important parts of his life in the movie and make it work really well. Right. And it, I feel like it all tied together pretty seamlessly. Cause like you said, like, People know who Gandhi is. He's a very recognizable figure, but in terms of, like, I had no idea he was a lawyer. I had no idea he fought for rights in South Africa. Like, that's how the movie starts, and like you said, he, he goes back to India, and people are kind of expecting, like, what? okay, what what's next? Like, we've mm-hmm. been really impressed with you. What else are you going to do? Um, so learning that aspect, I think, was really fascinating. Um, and you're right, Richard Attenborough did a good job of saying, like, here's someone, like, you think you might know everything, but let me tell you a little bit more. Um, and it was just so impressive, all the things he was able to do and the steps that he took. Like you said, the, the, I mean, this was one of my favorite parts, when he kind of helped inspire um, the nation say, like, hey, here are steps we can take for our independence. Like, close, we can make our own. We can do our own thing here. We don't need to buy from the British. We don't need to rely on them for so many things. And it, he just had such an amazing capacity to like get people to listen and follow him Mm -hmm. which is very impressive because yeah in in such a successful way yeah i mean so he was non-violent which i think when you outnumber your rulers by like however many fold they did that's probably the right move to do because just by being non-violent and not doing anything you're gonna shut down the country and prevent your opposing party to do whatever you wanted but it is impressive that with that many people that he's able to rally that many together. So it's just insane. Uh, so I completely understand wh- how or why it won Best Picture. This is complete. This is right up the Academy's alley with biopic. Uh, the uh, at this point the epic movies were very popular too. <clears throat> this is kind of towards the end of that craze, but mm-hmm. but it was still like if. You had a three-hour-long epic movie. I mean, you were probably viewed pretty well in the Academy's eyes as well. Uh, but, yeah, this is Ben Kingsley's kind of introduction to the world, and he completely became Gandhi. Like, I mean, his his acting, his performance alone just elevates this movie uh, because we'll get into it. There's some things about this movie that I think uh, maybe aren't as strong as some other movies of uh, like that maybe it mirrors or have come that came out before it but i mean his performance is uh incredible and this was i don't think it was his very first acting like movie but it's like this was his first big one and yeah. he just blew it out of the water well and it's fascinating too especially <laughs> i feel like when he's in um like the like fasting phase of gandhi is like that's when he looks the most like him and Um, you know, people reported that as they were filming this, like, on location, they had actual, like, Indian citizens think that he was, like, the reincarnation of the real Gandhi because he looked so much like him. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just incredible. Mm Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's insane. Um, and you, you'd go on to win Best Actor for it, so, I mean, completely understand why. (laughs) Yes. Um... But yeah, I, I had a couple. Did you have any other notes on the movie? I had a couple things about it and then some trivia about sure. it as well. Um, another thing that I really enjoyed was um, I, I think they did a good job of also incorporating like the British response to everything. And I feel like they like they shined a, a good light on how um, like British rule and colonialism kind of worked in the country. Like they're showing like certain like trials and sentencing and and they show the british rulers and like how should we respond to this and you know they're talking to this you know a 
someone from the military and he guns down like a thousand people and they're questioning him about it. So I, I think you really get the full picture of, you know, what Gandhi is saying from his side, but you also see, um, like the British colonial side as well. It's not just Gandhi saying, well, this is how the British are doing things. It's not just the Indian citizen saying, this is how things are going. You actually hear straight from the British rulers, what their thought process is. So I think that told a better story. Mm Mm-hmm. And I know mm. that we've said Haley doesn't like political stuff. She can't keep up with it. Whatever. This is a very politically driven movie. I mean, they're trying to, like, free themselves, basically, from British rule. And I loved it. It was super fascinating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, while while I... This movie was great. I, I like it a lot. There are some things about it that I wanted to at least bring up, and that's... So the movie, towards the end of the movie, when they're kind of breaking out in a little more of a civil war, when it's the Muslims against the Hindu, apparently this character that was this real life person, he didn't show in the best light. And that's the person who is like the, it, the Pakistani representative, uh, um, Jinnah. Mm-hmm. Throughout the whole time, ta- the whole movie, he's not really too supportive of Gandhi and he seems to be pretty jealous of him. And then at the end of the movie, he's kind of ruthlessly uh, taking parts of India and turning them into Pakistan. At least that's how the movie represents it. Apparently that critics and uh, the people of Pakistan did not really love that. That isn't true to like how he was actually a, a real person. And in fact, I think this movie was banned from Pakistan for a while, at least when it first came out. So that was one like real life portrayal that didn't Richard Attenborough really didn't handle too well apparently and then the other thing for me is when I watch this movie I just get so many shades of Lawrence of Arabia Mm -hmm. in the way that kind of how the story plays out and the fact that both movies start with his death and funeral and then the rest of the movie is a flashback and then there's aspects of this movie that remind me of aspects of Lawrence of Arabia like the salt march reminds me of the march on Aqaba um, we're going to rally this country together to, in Lawrence of Arabia, fight the Turks, and in this movie, fight for freedom. Uh, and it just, and maybe it's just that the Brits are kind of heavily involved in both movies, so maybe that's where I'm getting it. But I was getting a lot of shades of Lawrence of Arabia in this, which, you know, it's okay to take some ideas from it, but there's a lot of times in this where I'm just like, this just feels like that movie, but with a different, like lead character Mm -hmm. uh so you know good or bad or indifferent i noticed that that it may not have been the most original way to tell the story but that's what it is the plus they're both three hour long epics so maybe that has something to do with it yeah um but yeah other than that that's just kind of nitpicking when you get down to it that's just uh, it's a couple things i had but overall that was great yeah, and for me, too, in terms of, you know, things I would have done differently or things that I disliked, I feel it's a little nitpicky, too. I wish there was more music in it. Yeah, well, that's one thing very different from Lawrence of Arabia, yeah. because you, I can just hear the music from Lawrence of Arabia uh, throughout that movie, and in this movie, but yeah, other than what scene was it where I was rewatching it, and you were like, is that the intermission? I said, no. oh, it's when he's, he's, on, the he's train, on the train going around the country, kind of seeing the homeland. That's really the only time in the movie where there isn't any talking and there's music playing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I yeah, I wish there was more music, so. Fair enough. Should I do trivia first or do you want to do the score? Uh, let's do our scores. Okay. Um, so I gave this one an 8.4. Um, I said really enjoyable story and it was nice learning stuff about the movement in general. Uh, learning more about Gandhi and some of his early life I think was really fascinating. Um, but it's, you know, it's not a movie you can sit down and watch every single day, <laughs> but if you've got three hours, I think it's a really, uh, fascinating story. Mm-hmm. So an 8.4 for me. Mm-hmm. Yep. I gave it an 8.5. Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much the same things you were saying. Yeah. This isn't like a quick watch, uh, but it is worth it, especially if you're a history buff or if you're just interested in this person i mean it's a name everyone knows but maybe not everyone knows the story of so if you if you want that i mean documentaries are always a good thing for that but this i think this is a pretty good telling of it and i did look into it and 
and it is fairly accurate other than the couple of things I brought up. It is a fairly mm-hmm. accurate movie. Mm-hmm. So I think you, you'll still get a pretty good representation of who he was by watching this. Yeah, and like you said, especially with a lot of the stuff that's been in the news lately in terms of, um, you know, movements and racism and whatnot, it's... I feel like this one does hit it a little differently than, um, you know, when we first sat down and watched it. So it's kind of a nice um, related story in terms of uh, compassion and kind of, um, you know, getting people together for for the right cause. Mm-hmm. Very true. Very, very true. Uh, so, yeah, 8.4 for you, 8.5 for me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just a couple things is all on IMDb for Gandhi Trivia. Uh, so yeah, Ben Kingsley, obviously the star of this movie, he was actually born in Britain, but his parental family was from India and from the same state that Gandhi was from. Oh, okay. So that's kind of, kind of helps explain yeah, what it I, looks like. Yeah, I would say, so I didn't realize that they were from, like, the same, um, the same state, like, the same part of India. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, the Indian government provided one-third of this movie's budget. Mm-hmm. Which nice, yeah. Which I mean makes a lot of sense. So the budget, I guess, for this movie was twenty two million dollars. Box office wise, it did one hundred twenty seven point eight million dollars. So it did pretty good. It's a good return on investment. There. Yes. Uh, Dustin Hoffman had expressed an early desire to play the title role in this movie, but was offered Tootsie uh, the same year and ended up taking that role. Um, and yeah, then, that's probably a better choice. And then, yeah, and then he would go on to lose Best Actor to Ben Kingsley. Could you picture Dustin Hoffman? I mean, I know so whitewashing was something that happened a lot back then, but could you picture Dustin Hoffman playing Gandhi? Still, still does, but... Yeah, that happens a lot still. Um, yeah, that's really hard to picture. I mean, he's a smaller guy, so in terms of, like, stature, I can see it. I but... mean, I'm, he is not... Indian, like no, he just is, does not look. He does not look like Gandhi in any way. That huge nose. I can you give you picture Dustin Hoffman's huge, huge ass nose, like trying to look like I don't know. That's just nope. I don't know, I'm picturing him bald. I don't know if I can picture him bald. Yeah, that would that would have been a very no. different movie. <laughs> no, no, good good choice to go with Tootsie because he's very good in Tootsie, and obviously Ben Kingsley is much more fit. For the role of Gandhi for many reasons. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so also, so Richard Attenborough actually, so he won Best Director for this and like Best Picture. He was not expecting that. He actually expected and hoped, like he publicly said that he hoped that E.T. would win hmm. Best Picture and Director. Okay. Uh, and then oddly enough, uh, Spielberg would then go on to direct him in Jurassic Park, as we mentioned oh, earlier. Yeah. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. But yeah, that's, I think that's pretty much... Oh, yeah, John Ratzenberger was in this. Yes, that's right. Oh yeah, he's God. the one... So, yeah, I mentioned that Candace Bergen is in there for, like, a few scenes. And, yeah, she's, like, a reporter, photographer. And, yeah, John Ratzenberger is the one that, like, drives her to yeah, work on Yeah, it's one insane. scene. Yeah. But it's weird. So there's another part of this trivia. Uh, so his voice was dubbed by Martin Sheen. What? Yeah. That's what this says. I mean, I guess you can take IMDb for what it is for trivia. Interesting. But, because he does. Like, I mean, he's in all the Pixar movies. You can always tell which character is, is him. So, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, last, sorry, last, last bit of trivia. Daniel Day-Lewis in his <laughs> theatrical film debut is in this. He plays an asshole. As a, race, as a racist South African in the beginning of the movie. Uh, so yeah, a couple, couple debuts for people in this movie. and uh, Ben Kingsley, kind of, and then Daniel Day-Lewis. Too funny. Mm-hmm. Okay, we're done with Gandhi now? I believe so. Okay, now we're, we're on to E.T. Yep. All right, when was the last time you'd seen this movie? Probably not since I was, like, a kid. Yeah. Or middle school age. Maybe. I, I don't know. It had been a very long time. Yeah. I, I rewatch a lot of movies, but I have not seen this movie from start to finish in a very, very long time. Did you like it as a kid? Or watch it a lot as a kid? I didn't watch it a lot. I think it was one of those, like, I had seen it and enjoyed it, and that was probably it. 
Yeah, I watched it a lot as a kid, and I, I liked this movie a lot, so it was interesting to watch it again as an adult. So, yeah, I mean, I think everyone knows the story of E.T. An alien gets left behind. Uh, his family kind of accidentally leaves him, and he wanders into the... Uh, into the house of a family, uh, kind of a dysfunctional family. So Spielberg is a child of divorce, and he uses that a lot in his films, uh, including this one. So it's a single mother with three kids. The kids don't really get along. They're always yelling at each other. And then E.T. comes along, and they kind of band together to protect him from the government, uh, from all sorts of people, and try to get him home. Uh, which they do in the end. I mean, what were your thoughts on E.T. watching it over again? It was really fun watching it again. It was really good. Um, I forgot how humorous it is. Like, I mean, I, like, you know there's humor in it, but I think some of this stuff probably went over my head as a kid. Like, he, you know, E.T.'s home by himself for the first time, and he just starts chugging Coors Light. He's, like, that's, running into stuff. That's one of my favorite parts <laughs> you know? of the movie. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, that was probably funny to me as a kid, but it's funnier now because I understand, like, oh my God, he's getting drunk, you know? And it was it was fun to pick up on certain things, like, and, and I read up on this, too, that Spielberg intentionally, like, shot most of the film from, like, the kid's perspective, not from, like, an adult height, mm-hmm. but from, like, the kid's height. And it's something that, like, you definitely notice, like, as an as as an adult and you're watching it, I'm like, all the adults that have been in this film so far, like, besides the mom, like, we haven't seen anyone's faces. Yeah. You know, so stuff like that was kind of fun just to pick up on more of the technical stuff, but um, I just, I forgot how sweet of a story it is. Mm-hmm. It's so sweet. It is. Like, it, it's a movie about an alien, but at the heart of it, it's about a lot more than that, yeah. Which I love, and it works too. Yes. Um, you're right. I, I'll, the refrigerator scene when he's home alone and Elliot's at school. Uh, I love. That's one of my favorite scenes of the movie because one, it's funny. You know, yeah. E. T. gets drunk and he's running into cabinets and falling over, and the dog is there too, like <laughs> messing so, yeah, around. Yeah, he's with like him. dumping food out of the fridge, and the dog's eating up stuff. Um, yeah. But at the same, like at the same time, that scene is showing that him and Elliot have connection because mm-hmm. Elliot is getting drunk because E. T. is drunk. So yeah, I like that scene a lot. Uh, I was getting hints at the beginning of this movie. So this movie is similar to, I think, Jurassic Park and Jaws in a couple ways in the sense of, so E.T.'s an alien, they use a lot of practical effects for him, but like it isn't going to be perfect. So they had a lot of scenes of similar to Jaws where you don't see the whole thing. You just see like things moving because that's where E.T. Is, is, or you just see a hand because... You don't want to show the whole thing because you probably can't afford because that's what they did with the shark and Jaws. Steven Spielberg knew the shark doesn't look too realistic, so we're not going to show it a lot, and that kind of adds to the um, intensity. Mystique, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so similar things like that for E.T., but also I was getting hints at Jurassic Park because at the beginning of the movie they were just moving a bunch of plants around, and that's where E.T. was moving. Mm-hmm. Like That's just like the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park. Yes. Oh my god, that's a good point. Yeah. So that was cool. Um, I like how... First interaction, so he's in the shed at the beginning of the movie, E.T. is, and Elliot goes out there to see what's going on, and then just a ball gets tossed at him from out of the shed. <laughs> How quickly would you shit your pants oh and just god. run the I'm other way? I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I said. I'm like, oh my god, I would shit my pants if that happened. Yes. yes. <laughs> that was, um, I also like how the the bad, quote-unquote, bad guy in this movie who's in all the trucks chasing E.T., all you see are the keys. Yes. And it's shades of, like, the man with no eyes from Cool Hand Luke, where he doesn't talk or say anything, but all you do is just see his gun and, like, the sunglasses he wears. So I was getting shades of that, which was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, yeah, I just... You're right. Like, this movie, we watched, um, like, a making of for this with Steven Spielberg, and you brought up the camera angles from the kids. He wanted to do that because he had made... Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which he'd made from, like, an adult perspective, and he wanted to make something from the kid's perspective. So, like, I just completely agree that seeing this movie again as an adult, it's just really cool to see all these different aspects of it that we probably just went right over our heads as kids. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I think, like, the most important thing that it shows, and this... <laughs> 
like I think it shows it really well. Like I said, the first interaction that Elliot really has with ET is he's like he thinks there's someone in the shed, so he throws a ball in there, and then ET throws the ball back, and he freaks out. But instead of like being scared of this thing because he doesn't know it, he can't see it. Once he actually like comes face to face with ET, the f- his first instinct is to accept him, and he brings him into his room, and he he is just like going through. He's like. Uh, this is Coke. Um, you drink it. It's, it's, it's like food. And this is a car and this is what we drive around in, but this is like a toy car. And and he just goes like, I don't like, he's so excited to like teach this new creature. He's a kid. Like you kids just always want to explain things. Yes, exactly. And the most important part is that he, like his, his instinct is to accept. Whereas the adults, their instinct is to like, react negatively. Mm-hmm. And this is a thing we need to control, and we need to study it, and we need to figure out what the hell this is. Yeah, it's a typical alien yeah. kind of trope. Like, we need to study it and kill it, whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I there were a couple things, like, this. the mom in this, she's way too oblivious to things. <laughs> like, when she comes home after uh, E.T. drank all the Coors and everything, and that house is a mess, she's just walking around like there's... E.T. literally walks past her, like, two or three Twice. times. Twice! <laughs> right past her. You're telling me you don't notice this thing moving around? That's insane to me. She's a working single I... mother to three. Yes, <laughs> I understand. But, it's still <laughs> but to have some, I don't know, weird, naked, <laughs> like alien creature running around your house and not noticing that's pretty weird yeah and i know spielberg in the the making of video like he said the mom is kind of a child too like i I get that but like damn (laughs) jeez like the opening scene is um what's the oldest brother or mike michael right um he and his friends are like sitting at the kitchen table playing card games whatever and they've got cigarettes on the table you don't see anyone actually smoking it but they've got cigarettes burning on the table and Mm -hmm. mom's just Loading the dishwasher, like, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, my 12-year-old kids have got cigarettes out here. I'm like, is that normal? I was completely thrown off by that scene because I assumed they were home alone, but then the mom showed up in her room. She's like, hey, guys, what's going on? I'm like, whoa, you're, like, allowing this? What's (laughs) going on? That's crazy. Also, so E.T., and then he builds, like, a, a satellite to radio his family. There is no way that... That house would have what E.T. would need to do that. <laughs> to communicate with to, outer space. The, ju- they ju- the technology just does not exist. <laughs> like, throwing aluminum foil on an umbrella and retweaking one of those, like, uh, one of those boards. What was it? Like, the numerical thing that they were punching in. Yeah, the red. it, like, reads out whatever yeah. you type into There's it. There's no way that that technology exists. I get E.T. is smart, but, like... E.T. is very smart. He's extremely smart. One thing I did not pick up on. Yeah. But, but like, As he can't kid. change the technology in that house to work. I just, I'm sorry. I know it's a kid's movie, <laughs> but I am sorry. Um, and I'll say things get, I mean, this part freaked me out a little bit as a kid. Things get kind of weird when the government shows up to the house. Yes. And, I still uh, did not like that. I didn't mind it, but it's just there's things that happen there. I get the idea of, like, you got to keep it in the house and turn the house into, like, a clean room. I'm okay with that. But they're, like, rolling one of the tubes down the street. I'm like, you can't just pack that up and then bring... Like, it, that was just kind of weird. And it was weird that when they first break into the house, they're wearing, like, astronaut suits. Yeah. Like, shouldn't you be wearing, like, hazmat... Which they eventually wear hazmat suits. But, like, why yeah. aren't you wearing hazmat like, suits legit, initially? Na- and it's, like, it's not easy to move around in that shit. It's not yeah. meant to be worn on Earth. So why they were wearing it, I yeah. don't know. I-, I was almost expecting, like, is this some weird, like dream or like imagination of what's going on i'm like oh, i guess this is real thought that was weird that i would say that would be my critique of this movie i still was not fond of like all yeah the government i mean stuff. yeah it was just, i mean that's oh, fair weird. that's fair it's very it's very uh interesting but yeah and the only other thing i don't know if they really need to do this or not but they don't really explain why he's getting sick and how he gets better no. i don't i don't know if you need to but that's just something i noticed this time around so yeah uh anyways we'll give our score after real justice which i guess we can get into right now so we're yep. pitting up gandhi against et for best picture richard attenborough himself said uh he wanted et to win so let's see what we think here um i'll, I'll say it right now this was probably the hardest one 
yes. I've done. This yes. is the most difficult one that I've had to do so far. I agree. So I'll, I'll say it off the bat. Like I'm fine with either one winning, but, you know, we're going to try to narrow it down to one. Okay. Which, out of, let's see, I mean, let's start off with an easy one. Music or score. Um, E.T. Yeah. Duh. Starting Men's off. Down. You're right. This, this, that was probably the easy, like, the yeah. one single category is probably the easiest we've ever done for real justice yeah. was music. Because like, there's almost yeah. none in Gandhi, and John Williams won best score for this, and it's so iconic. I love it. It's beautiful. It's perfect. Yeah. Like, that, let's start perfect. off with a softball. Okay. Easy. <laughs> um, E.T. Yep. I'll say, this one was the next easiest one for me. I'm kind of going in randomish order but That's this fine. one to me was the next easiest one that was acting yes like the kid i love okay i like it when kids are good at acting because it's tough it's tough to get good kid actors and they were good in this they movie were. i mean drew barrymore is a little girl she had lived a couple times she was great in it <laughs> uh, they were great but when you have Kent ben kingsley basically becoming gandhi I mean, and then you have a couple other supporting roles in there too like martin sheen a little bit like it's it's tough to compete with that. So yep. I had Gandhi. Yes. And you, I assume you did too. I did. Yep. Which one did you want? Do you want to do technical or writing? Which one? Um, let's do technical next. Okay. This this one was the hardest one for me. Okay. So for me, I was basically looking at it in this way. Did the visual slash practical and sound effects of E.T. beat out the costume design and cinematography of Gandhi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and for me, I picked E.T. Because mm -hmm. I think I think to this day, like, the practical effects of of E.T. himself still look really good. They do. And, you know, the visual effects are still good, too. We watched the anniversary edition, so maybe they touched it up a little bit. Sure. But, I mean, we even talked about when we watched it, but the waddling noises, the sound effects that went into <laughs> it, and... And all that, like, <laughs> yeah. I thought was were really good. And while, you know, it, it's tough when you have, um, it's not Lawrence of Arabia level, but the cinematography and look of Gandhi is really good. And yeah, the costume design is really good too, but I, I still was picking E.T. on this one to edge it out. I agree. I had E.T. winning this as well. It's... Um, you're right, E.T. as a character, like, I'm still amazed, like, watching them, like, they did this almost 40 years ago, and I'm still very, very impressed with, like, the practical effects and the fact that, like, they had people in the actual, like, E.T. suit sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I think that was really impressive, and <laughs> maybe this is kind of silly, but you look at how, like, amazing how well done that was when you look at, um you know, Ben Kingsley's, like, ear prosthetics, and you look at it and you go, those are not great prosthetics. <laughs> it's like, you're doing ears versus, like, an entire alien body. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I was like, yeah, I think E.T., it adds more to the story. Yeah, it was close, though. Like, that very was, close. this is very tough. Yep. But, yeah, so then fourth one is writing. This one was also pretty tough for me, too, so... Have we agreed on everything so far? So far we okay. have. Okay, yep. It's two to one E.T. Yep. Um, writing was tough for me because this is how I looked at it. It was, you have E.T. where Steven Spielberg literally took, like, a personal story of his about a broken family, like, dysfunctional, they're arguing all the time, and then, like, you enter this alien and it brings the family together and... You know, they beat the odds, they, you know, go up against the government, and they, they bring him home, and it's emotional. Like, it's about Elliot, and, like, E.T. is his best friend, and he has to let him go. Like, it's very and emotional. He, and he knows that that's what he needs to do, yeah. even though he doesn't want to. In fact, Steven Spielberg, he was asked to make a sequel, and he said he spent a couple months on it, and he just, like, I can't do it. Like, I can't do it. Like, it I ended can't. perfectly. Exactly. I, uh, and so... That's E.T., and then you look at Gandhi, and I looked at, like, they were able to take this, you know, this man's life, or at least 50, 60 years of his life, and they turned it into a three-hour movie and still hit the important parts and themes of it and made it work. So it was really tough. I did go with Gandhi because, you know, this, I mean, it was close. Like, what's, is it easier to do a real-life story or not because you have the source material? I don't know. 
But I went with Gandhi because it still the movie was three hours long, kept me engaged, and it hit the important point, points of this man's life that he did so much in. That's almost verbatim what, what I was thinking, too, is that, uh, you know, I think E.T. is it's more fun, it's more creative, um, especially when you consider we found out, too, that Spielberg, like, basically narrated this story to a screenwriter while he was on the set working on Indy. Yeah, like, on Raiders. <laughs> yeah. On Raiders of the Lost Ark, so... I mean, that kind of adds Harrison to Ford's some lore. wife at the time? I think that's well, right. They're in a relationship. I don't remember if they were married yeah. or not. I think they were. Um, so that's, you know, that makes it more interesting. But like I said, the fact that you can take um, the life of someone who is already pretty well known and still tell it in a fascinating way and add new information, I'm giving it to Gandhi as well. Oh, really? It's for gridlocked. Oh, all tied up to yep. two. Uh, for me, so yeah, the last one is just which one did I enjoy more? This was actually, other than music, this might have actually been one of the easier ones for me. I just enjoy watching E.T. more. Like, it's way more rewatchable, which I don't, isn't always, like, a key factor in this, but it's more rewatchable. It's more emotional to me. Um, and it's more fun to watch, like you said. Like, I don't know, it's... It made me feel more emotions than I thought I would watching it again as a, an adult. And I just, it's just different, right? Like, it's a movie about an alien. We've said it before already. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and Gandhi, I mean, he's an important figure in person. And I'm not trying to, like, take away anything from that movie. But E.T. is just something that, like, hadn't seen. Like, had anyone seen anything like that before or since? Like, it's just, I just enjoyed it more. So I, I, pick that one as my tiebreaker Mm -hmm. yeah and the thing that was that i liked about both movies is they're they're both about progress and compassion and like they teach you different lessons in different ways but for me et is more enjoyable and give the win to the et look at us we agreed on everything which does not always happen but um outside of this podcast included very very tough putting these two against each other um, they have so many similarities, but they're completely different movies, uh, in the end. But, um, for me, I think E.T. edges this one out. No, fair. Yeah. I, so, I mean, I, I'm just always going to ask this, but you're okay. Like you would have picked E.T. to win best picture over Gandhi. Do you think? I think so. Like I would, it's tough because Gandhi is such like an Oscar. Baby. I know. Like, and I, I feel like people put a negative connotation to that, but like, I don't, I'm not taking anything away from Gandhi, but it's. It's an epic biopic movie, like about a great man, and there's nothing wrong with that. But mm-hmm. like that's such an Oscar movie, mm-hmm. and E.T. is just not, you know. And I I would have picked E.T. I like it when different genres can get some representation too. Yep. Uh, so I I would have I would have been happy. I would have been fine if either of them would have won. And there's actually another movie we'll talk about shortly that I would have been fine with if it would have won too. But I I would have liked it if E.T. would have won Best Picture. And I gave it a 9.1. Ooh, a 9.1. Very nice. I gave e- E.T. an 8.2. Ooh. That's, that's a, a lower little, score. Know, that's, that's lower little, than Gandhi. It's a little lower. It's, well, because, yeah, like, for me, the, the thing I critique about Gandhi is that I wish there was more music, which is, like, so, like, unimportant. Um, for E.T., like, the majority of the, like, governmental storyline like I just, I, I really didn't like it, so it is a little bit lower, but I don't know. That's my justification. Good. That's fine. All right, and into a look at the nineteen eighty two, well, the the fifty fifth Academy Awards. Um, that number's wrong. That's the old one. <laughs> it's the fifty fifth Academy Awards. Uh, movies from nineteen eighty two, which, like yes. I mentioned. There was actually a lot of good stuff that came out this year. I mean, we'll hit on most of them throughout the way, but, I mean, we've talked about Gandhi and um, E.T. a little bit. Here's a, just a couple other random ones that came out that year, too. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, The Road Warrior, which is the second Mad Max movie before Fury Road. This was considered the best one. Uh, Blade Runner, Conan the Barbarian, The Dark Crystal, First Blood, so uh, Rambo, First Blood, 
48 Hours, which is a Nick Nolte, Eddie Murphy movie. Uh, one of my dad's favorite movies, The Man from Snowy River, came out. Uh, Poltergeist came out. Spielberg oh, wow. made that. He didn't direct it, but he wrote it. And he made that and E.T. at the same time. Cool. Porkies. <laughs> uh, Quest for Fire. Rocky Three, Star Trek Two, Wrath of Khan. Uh, the Thing. Khan. Yeah, Khan. The Thing. Tron. Uh, and then another one I watch all the time as a kid, but The Secret of Nim. Oh, okay. So, I mean, there's more, and we'll talk about them with the Oscars, but there's yeah. a lot of stuff came out in 1982. Sneaky good year. Mm-hmm. Cool. I'll start with, um, I'll start going through the categories then, and we can kind of add a little commentary yeah. on the other. Yeah. I got, I got here. some comments here, but not, not a ton. But yeah, go, cool. go for it. Um, so first off, we've got uh, Best Supporting Actress. And we've got nominations for Glenn Close in The World According to Garp, uh, Terry Garr in Tootsie, Kim Stanley in Francis, Leslie Ann Warren in Victor Victoria, and then the winner went to Jessica Lange in Tootsie. Mm, so I think this was pretty easy that Jessica Lange won. She knocks that role out of the park in Tootsie. I don't think there was really too much competition for her for this, but... Uh, Victor Victoria, which we'll talk about a little bit some more, is you had me watch that movie for the first time a couple of years ago. That movie was great. Uh, the only person that I thought of to maybe plug in here, uh, Zelda Rubenstein from Poltergeist. So she played the medium or the psychic. Okay. She that was actually a pretty good role. I actually always think of her from that Disney movie. Was it Teen Witch? I don't know if you ever watched that. No, it's like I don't think I ever the saw unpopular that. girl finds out she's a witch, and Zelda Rubenstein is like the person that tells her she's a witch, and then she makes herself popular. <laughs> really good Disney movie. Nice. Um, I, th- I thought about trying to plug her in here. I haven't seen all these movies. Actually, the only one I haven't seen is the Francis one. Um, so maybe I would take Kim Stanley out, but I haven't seen it, so I think that's a little unfair. But that's the only mm-hmm. person I could think of to bring up in this category. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on to Best Point Actor, uh, we have nominations for Charles Durning in The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, John Lithgow in The World According to Garp, James Mason for The Verdict, Robert Preston for Victor Victoria, and then the winner was, uh, Louis Gossett Jr. for An Officer and a Gentleman. <laughs> An Officer and a Gentleman. Yeah, so, watched that for the first time recently, An Officer and a Gentleman, so he plays the drill sergeant, kind of um, Arlie uh, Emery role before that, because this is pre Full Metal Jacket, and he's great in it, and I'm completely fine with him winning. But some other roles, um, actually, some that weren't even nominated that I thought about trying to plug in here. So another person in an officer and gentleman who I thought was really good was David Keith. He's like the best friend of. Um, Richard Gere's character in this, and he kind of goes through some shit in that movie, and I thought he was really good. Uh, Sean Penn, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Scapoli, like how can you not give Scapoli an Oscar (laughs) nomination? Uh, And then the last one is the one that we finished watching this morning. Uh, Kevin Kline and Sophie's Choice was pretty good. He was pretty good. And that was his uh, first movie. Nice. Okay. He actually filmed another movie before Sophie's Choice, but because of production issues, that one got released after Sophie's Choice. So this mm-hmm. was like the first movie he appeared in. He was pretty good in that. It's yeah. like a guy who kind of slowly goes crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But but yeah, I mean, I'm fine with Luke Gossett getting the win. The only other two people out of the current the nom- actual nominees that I thought of was I mean Robert Preston is pretty good in Victor Victoria. I mean, he's maybe the best part of that movie. He is. I think so. No, I, I agree. And then, man, I would have been fine if James Mason would have won for the verdict. Mm-hmm. He plays the opposing lawyer against Paul Newman's character. He was, yeah, he, was pretty, he was pretty good. He's not in it a whole lot, or at least as much as Luke Gossick Jr. is, but I would have been fine if he would have won too. Yeah. What's funny about seeing, um, like, a number of nominations here for Tootsie and Victor Victoria is they're both very similar um, in the sense that they have men playing women and women playing men. Yeah. And it's 
It's one of those things, like, I feel like that happened all the time in, like, Shakespearean plays. It's like, really? Like, how many men do we pass off for women and vice versa? Like, is that really a thing? And it's like, we're still making movies about that. Well, it's, so it's funny. It's like a common trope. And it's funny. Shout out to filmsite.org, which I use sometimes for some of my research. Uh, <laughs> This says here, 1982 became known as the year with many cross-dressing, gender-reverse trans <laughs> performances with roles and confused sexual identities because of Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie, uh, Julie Andrews and Robert Preston, Victor Victoria, and John Lithgow in the world, according to Garp. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that one, too. I haven't seen that, but I, yeah, forgot to mention because, um, yeah, John Lithgow's role as Roberta. Yeah. Will do, so, yes. so, yeah. Yeah, it's great. 1982. There you go. What, a, what an amazing year. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, I'll go through the Best Actress nominees here. Uh, Julie Andrews for Victor Victoria. Jessica Lange for Francis. Sissy Spacek for Missing. Deborah Winger for An Officer and a Gentleman. And then Meryl Streep won for Sophie's Choice. Meryl, Meryl. Um, so I've seen all of these except for Francis. Uh, Deborah Winger... And an officer and gentleman is good, but she doesn't, she doesn't show up until like over 30 minutes into that movie. So it's kind of interesting to see mm-hmm. lead actress, but she was really good in it. Sissy Spacek uh, is good in Missing. That's I haven't seen the movie in so long. I think she plays the wife of like so, a reporter who goes missing overseas, and Jack Lemmon is the father who comes over to find him. Uh, but Julie Andrews, I mean, really good in Victor Victoria. I love it when she, when she like, hide cockroaches and she uses them to try to get free meals at restaurants. Mm-hmm. Classic move. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, I mean, I think Meryl, this is pretty easy. I jokingly bash on Meryl every once in a while, but... <laughs> every once in a while. Every time she comes up, you joke about it. But she's a great actress, <laughs> and, I mean, she... I mean, she's the titular character for this movie. She owns yeah. this movie from start to finish. I think this is a pretty easy choice mm-hmm. for her to win Best Actress. Uh, I, the only thing I'll say is I think Jessica Lange was considered the runner-up or, like, the second favorite. Okay. And uh, she would have won Best Actress and Best Supporting Actress in That's the same so crazy. year. If Meryl would have made this movie in a different year or something. That's so weird. I know. I, like, feel like all these... Same names and same movies are just over and over again, so very mm-hmm. cool. Um, Best Actor nominees, as we mentioned, Dustin Hoffman for Tootsie, uh, Jack Lemmon in Missing, Paul Newman in The Verdict, Peter O'Toole for My Favorite Year, and then Ben Kingsley won for Gandhi. So a couple people, you know, maybe left out of this. Uh, Harrison Ford for Blade Runner. I mean, that movie isn't really necessarily known for his acting, but yeah. but he's the lead in it, and it's a classic movie. Uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but the guy that plays Stingo in Sophie's Choice. You could have maybe thrown him in there. Oh, yes. Uh, Peter McNichol? McNichol's right? right. So, yeah, you probably got the first name right. Um, the guy from Ally McBeal. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty good in that movie as well. Um, but the one that I think is the biggest omission from this is Richard Gere for An Officer and a Gentleman. I don't know what the Academy has against him, uh, but he's never gotten an Oscar nomination before. Really? And he's, I mean... He's got to be one of the few, like, A-list actors to not have any nominations. Yeah, it's cr- it's kind of weird. I mean, this would be one of the furly- earliest versions of him not getting that nomination, but, like, we're going to talk about this movie eventually, but Chicago... Didn't get a nomination for. Primal Fear is a good movie that he's in. He didn't get a nomination for. It's kind of weird. I don't know what's going on there. So I would I would probably plug Richard Gere in for Best Actor and take Peter O'Toole out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be my only change in the nominees for this. I mean, I, you can't really take the win away from Ben Kingsley. He like becomes Gandhi. We talked about it for how long already. But if I were to just embrace debate, I'm not actually going to change it. But if I were to embrace it, I would have had... I mean, I would have had a problem because there's no way Ben Kingsley can lose for Gandhi. But Paul Newman <laughs> in The Verdict and Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie are iconic roles. I mean, if either of those movies come out a different year, they would maybe win. Um, Dustin Hoffman is fantastic in Tootsie as Michael Dorsey or Dorothy Michaels. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I think Paul Newman playing Frank Galvin, I think that's his best acting. He's so good. I think that... 
people, you know, you'd win an Oscar a couple years after this for the sequel to The Hustler, uh, The Color of Money for playing uh, Eddie, Fast Eddie Felsen. So a lot of people consider that his best role, or HUD, or Cool Hand Luke. Uh, cool Hand Luke might be up there as like 1A for me or 1B. But him in this, as Frank Galvin, he is amazing. I do. I think this this is my favorite acting of his. This is my favorite role of his. Yeah, we sat down and watched that, and he was just phenomenal. It's a courtroom drama, so it's just like it's... I, I love that genre, and it was just a really fascinating like case. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about it was... Me- medical malpractice, and it was just interesting. Yeah. He, and he was so good. He plays this drunk lawyer trying to get redemption, and... He's he's, he's, he's done amazing. like four cases in three years yeah. or vice versa. He's an ambulance chaser <laughs> trying to like pull off the best case of his life. It is he's amazing. We may do a, a full review on this down the road, but I if if it wasn't Ben Kingsley, I'd want Paul Newman to get the win here. Agreed. Um looking at best director nominees, we had Wolfgang Peterson and Das Boot. Steven Spielberg for E.T., Sidney Pollack for Tootsie, Sidney Lumet for The Verdict, and then Richard Attenborough won for Gandhi. So we've talked about Richard Attenborough and like, and how this he directed this movie, and he did a phenomenal job doing it, uh, trying to, you know, putting 50 plus years of this guy's life into a three hour movie. But are the other nominees, I mean, Spielberg. Great. We've talked about how he used the different camera angles to make it look like a kid's point of view, uh, which is, I mean, technically speaking, that was that was awesome to notice that as an adult and mm-hmm. just seeing that none of the adults except the mom, like all the authoritative figures for adults, like you never saw their heads. Right. Was really cool. Uh, Sidney Pollack, Tootsie is. I mean, it's a really funny movie. It's really great. I don't directorial wise. I haven't seen it in a while, but I, I don't know about anything crazy he did there. Sidney Lumet is a classic director that has never won that never won Best Director. Uh, I, the verdict. I mean, we'll talk about Best Picture, but he did a great job with that. Someone missing from this list that I would maybe try to throw in is Ridley Scott for Blade Runner. Like mm-hmm. I kind of ho hum brought up Harrison Ford for Best Actor. I yeah. don't think his acting is what makes that movie great. I think the directing of Ridley Scott is what makes that movie great. So I would absolutely plug in Ridley Scott here. And I would maybe take out Sidney Pollack or Wolfgang Peterson for Das Boot. That one's tough. That's a foreign film that's pretty good. So maybe take out Sidney Pollack uh, for Ridley Scott. And I like Richard N. Burrow, but I I thought this movie was too similar to Lawrence of Arabia to really like be like, yeah, the directing in this is really amazing. Like it's a lot of classical, like keep this keep the camera still in one spot, all right, cut, move on to the next. It wasn't anything crazy other than just the epic scope of it, and maybe that was enough for him to get the win. I would give Steven Spielberg the win here. I I would too. Like, what he did and the different angles and stuff like that, I thought was a lot more creative than what Richard Attenborough did. So I would give the win to Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, Looking at the Best Picture nominees this year, we had E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Missing, Tootsie, The Verdict, and the winner is Gandhi. All right, here's a list of movies that did not get a Best Picture nomination. <laughs> I brought some of them up already, but Victor Victoria didn't. That, yeah. that got a handful of other nominations. Uh, the Man from Snowy River uh, didn't get any, like any nominations that we brought up here today. Uh, it was nominated for a Golden Globe, I think, for Best Foreign Film, because it's technically Australian. Uh, Poltergeist didn't get a nomination. That was on my top five horror movies back yep. when we did that ranking. Uh, Road Warrior basically got shut out. I'm not saying it should get a Best Picture nomination, but that movie's really good. Oddly enough, An Officer and a Gentleman and Sophie's Choice, neither of them got a Best Picture nomination. I mean, I think this is just a really strong year in movies. Because, um, like, The Thing, that's a horror movie. I think that's one of the best horror movies of all time. I think I had it number two on my list. That same list mm-hmm. that I brought up, I think I had a number two. Like, show some love to a different genre, maybe give that a Best Picture nomination. Uh, but Blade Runner, I think, deserves the Best Picture nomination. That movie is just so classic. Uh, it, it redefined a genre in sci-fi. Um, so I would, I would give that a Best Picture nomination, and I would take out Missing. Uh, I haven't seen that movie in a while, so maybe it's unfair to do that, but... 
I remember not being totally engaged in that movie. It's still an interesting movie and, you know, good. And it's not a bad movie. It's still really good. But I would I would plug in Blade Runner, take out Missing. I mean, we already just we already debated between Gandhi and E.T. winning Best Picture. So, like, I would probably say E.T. should win. But I'm not going to lie. The Verdict might be my favorite movie out of it's all of these so nominees. so good. So, so good. I really enjoyed it. I'm, like, I... I between E.T. and The Verdict, I don't really care one of those two, but I would have no problems if The Verdict won Best Picture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was, that, that movie is so good. And you, you, I mean, you watched a handful of these. I kind of had you sit down and watch The Verdict <laughs> and Sophie's Choice. Uh, any thoughts on Best Picture or any of these other categories from you? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think it's surprising that <laughs> Sophie's Choice isn't in there. And I think maybe part of that is just, I feel like it's, like, you know, this many years on, like, its reputation kind of precedes it. Like, I don't know if I feel like, oh, it needs that just because it's, like, an iconic type movie. But, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't be opposed to that being nominated. I said Victor Victoria is a fantastic movie. It's um, my mom and my Aunt Kathy. It's, like, one of their favorite stories. Um, so I've seen it a few times. And it's it's entertaining and it's kind of goofy sometimes. But it's a very sweet story. So, um Plus, I mean, Julie Andrews in a musical-type movie. Like, how can you not give that some recognition? <laughs> so, um, yeah, a lot of great stuff came out in 82. Mm-hmm. So, it, it was Hidden fun. Gym. Yeah, exactly. And it was, it was very fun watching some of these movies. So, um, that's all I have to mm. add into this. Um, it was a fun year. No, very fair. All right, let's get on to our last section here. So, our top five in honor of Ben Kingsley... Kind of, this was his breakthrough role. Uh, we did top five breakthrough roles. So let's go five to one. What was your number five? Um, my number five. And so, okay, so here's kind of how I looked at it as, like, um, their first, like, known role. Like, I realized some of these, like, they've been in other stuff before. But this is, like, one of their first big roles and uh, kind of, like, the success of their career afterwards. Yeah, I went with people who were successful afterwards. I think all of mine would go on to win an Academy Award afterwards, or for their role. Cool. Okay, good. Um, So my number five is Ryan Gosling. His role in Remember the Titans. Oh, man. Because I do. I like his role in that so much, and he's just, he's really funny, and to think he goes from that to like having a, a really successful career in a number of different movies so i know that's not the first role that everyone thinks of him in but when i think of ryan gosling i always remember him from that movie all right if that's so, who you remember him for then there you five. go my number five is matthew mcconaughey and dazed and confused very nice very quotable just all right, all right, all right. <laughs> exactly. That's why I like high school girls, man. I keep getting older and they stay the same age. Oh, my God. So inappropriate. Classic McConaughey. So inappropriate. <laughs> it's okay. Um, my number four is Sigourney Weaver in Alien. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. She hasn't had, like, the most critically acclaimed career. She's um, been nominated for, like, three Oscars. Okay. I'll take that back. <laughs> I, no, I mean you're right. Like she hasn't, she's never won one, and she she's had a, a like a lull to sure. to say in her career. So I didn't mean to like total bash, but she's had a good career. She's, you know, three Oscar noms. Um, but yeah, to have such a strong uh, performance in that movie, and yeah, just have a um, I, like everyone knows who she is. So including your dad. Yes, my dad's a big fan of Sigourney Weaver. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I saw Alien, I'm like, mm, I think I get it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of guys were thinking that, especially towards the end. Uh, my number four is Natalie Portman in Leon the Professional. She's a, a little girl in this, and mm-hmm. uh, Leon, he, he's played by, uh, what's his name, Gene R- Reno. Uh, he's in, think of this, he's a good actor. The movie I think of him in is fucking Godzilla from 1998. Um, but... See, it's like Ryan Gosling. Mm, remember the Titans? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But he, he plays a hitman who, like, takes care of her. Like, she she kind of ends up in his, like, as his responsibility and he takes mm-hmm. care of her. Got Gary Oldman's the bad guy in that movie. So, 
good movie, breakout role, and obviously we know she's going to win an Oscar, so Natalie Portman in The Professional. Okay. Um, my number three, we've talked about him plenty this episode, is Ben Kingsley. Um, so incredible for, like, his first big performance to carry that entire movie and to have done so many amazing roles since then. It's, I mean, it's the reason we did this list, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, got my, I've got my number three. Yeah, can't blame you for that. Uh, my number three is another child actor at the time. She got nominated for this role. That's Jodie Foster for Taxi Driver. Mm-hmm. She plays a, like a 10-year-old prostitute. Gross. That, yes, that uh, uh, Robert De Niro is trying to free from her pimp. Okay. Yeah, I've never seen that movie. So. Yeah, we'll have to watch that sometime. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nice, that was your number three. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number two is Lupita Nyong'o in 12 Years a Slave. Again, just a phenomenal role in that movie. I don't think anyone knew who she was before this, and she's done a number of amazing things since then. She was so incredible in Us, how she did not get an nom- Oscar nomination for that. Yeah, I think... Like, I think we brought that up in our Oscar it was a pretty episode. Year. I remember it being stacked last year. Um, but it's one of those things like, oh, she was just so good in it. She's done a number of things. She's done some voice acting and stuff in the Star Wars movies. And so I think that's just an amazing way to kind of kick off her Hollywood career. Mm-hmm. Uh, my number two is Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. Mm. That was his first role. That's good. And that's like iconic. I mean, that, that is good. That role in itself is iconic, and obviously he went. And he's won two Oscars since then. He's one of the best American actors of all time. And it all started with The Graduate. Mrs. Robinson, are you trying to seduce me? <laughs> that's good. I like that. Um, my number one is uh, Matt Damon in Goodwill Hunting. I know that he was like the lead in The Rainmaker. That same year, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think that came... Yeah. Yeah, I think it might have came out um, that same year. But yeah. in terms of, like... a smaller movie, though. Yes. In terms of, like, a breakthrough role, he's so good in that movie. I love that character. Obviously, like, the writing was just so good in that movie. And he has had such a phenomenal mm-hmm. career. We just rewatched Ford v. Ferrari. Yeah. So, he's my number one. No, it's I mean, that's one of my favorite movies of all time, so yeah. I can't knock you for that, and he is phenomenal. Part of the reason it. why I picked him, like, Matt can't argue with me on this one. No, playing defense on that, all right? <laughs> exactly. Um, my number one is your number two. It's Lupita Nyong'o for 12 Years a Slave. Nice. Yeah, she, I mean, she's just, the movie is so brutal, and she is, <sighs> like, bru- like good, but, like, and you know what I mean? Like, it's tough to watch, but she's so good in it. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just insane that mm-hmm. that was her first role. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've got the same number one. Some I don't know if you have any honorable mentions. I do. Yeah. Did you want to list them off real quick? I have some sure. too. Um, this one's pretty top of mind just because we talked about this movie. But Drew Barrymore, um, in E. T. It's one of those things like her. She was fine in her role as what like yeah. five or six year old kid. She's kind of funny. She uh, had some ad lib yeah, moments. Yeah. That were funny she was that. an interesting. <laughs> she's the one who dresses up E. T. and like. Her dress up clothes and puts a wig on it mm-hmm. and stuff, so that's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, to have you know a pretty long lasting career from that is kind of cool. So I've heard um, two others. I this is kind of along the lines of Ryan Gosling, where you look at like the first role I think of them from and what they've done since then is Brie Larson in Twenty One Jump Street. It was like one of the first things I saw her in, and she's you know, become, like, a phenomenal actress. You don't think of her as the au pair from The League getting <laughs> Eiffel Towered by Rafi? That too. But I always remembered, like, oh, Brie Larson, she's the one from 21 Jump Street. Um, and then, very similarly, Emma Stone in Superbad. She has kind of, they both have kind of small roles, you know, alongside these just, oh, alongside Jonah Hill. I'm just realizing that. Because yeah, I was yeah, going to say, oh, it's like, doofus guys. I'm Michael like, Sarah. In high school, yep. Um, and to actually become, like, Oscar-nominated, Oscar-winning actresses. Um, They're both winning. Yep. They both won, yeah. Yep. Uh, so, it's kind of funny to think of the first things I remember them yeah. in. Oh, I also had Emma Stone from Superbad as an honorable mention. I mean, Margot Robbie in Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. 
Uh, Edward Norton in Primal Fear. That was her, his first role. He got nominated for it, and he's dead movie. I don't want to give anything away, but crazy. Uh, ben Kingsley, obviously. Uh, Christian Bale in Empire of the Sun. Another kid, like, acting role. Oh, for Spielberg, too, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jamie Bell, Billy Elliot. Mm. Is a, I like that one. There you go. Ellen Page and Juno. Yep. Uh, Sean Penn, Fast Times. I kind of brought that one up already. Uh, Brad Pitt, Thelma and Louise. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Cameron Diaz in The Mask. <laughs> yeah. That's the hottest I think she's ever been. Like she, <laughs> like she's good looking, but I think that that her that movie, her and that, that's the hottest that she's ever been. Side note. <laughs> <laughs> And then, as a joke, I said Scarlett Johansson in Home Alone 3. Oh, my God. <laughs> she plays the sister in that. People forget. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, good. Well, those are some good, good breakthrough roles. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. All right. And that's, that's all we got mm-hmm. for today. Mm-hmm. So, next up, we have a movie from the 60s, uh, from the mid-60s, so keep an eye out for that. I kind of do the emoji thing, so I don't want to give it away here, but uh, it's a musical. I'll just say that. The 60s had like four or five musical winners, so I don't, think I'm, not, I don't think I'm giving too much away there. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. I think half of them were musicals. So. Yeah. Yep, yep. Make sure to follow us on social media. Uh, we're at Oscar Real Pod on both uh, Instagram and Twitter. Please, uh, if you listen to us, just... Tell a friend, like, try to expand the reach a little bit. Just tell what one person you know to give uh, one of our episodes a listen. Uh, and also leave a, a review and rating if you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts. Uh, and, yeah, just keep an eye out for our next couple episodes that we have, whether whether it's classic reviews or current buzz or the good, bad, the garbage that I've been doing with some friends. Uh, so, yeah, for Matt and Haley, this has been the Oscar Real Movie Podcast.